welcome to another of our question and answer sessions. Um, what's interesting about the process is often the questions you ask sort of trigger memories and new angles and thoughts. So it's always nice to see them coming in. And we've had a few today and we're going to start with a question from David Richardson who asked, he clearly knows the names of the ships, the Grasjur, um, and the, the one I like is the Holy Ghost, the H-O-L-I-G-O-S-T, the Holy Ghost. Um, and we know where possibly some of these wrecks are. Um, English Heritage has got a wreck designated site near Swanwick, which has got some of these boats, they believe the remains of these boats there. Um, David's question was, why weren't they all built in one place? Why did they apparently get built in various locations? Um, the possible answer to that, David, is that um, if you think of a, a, one of these things being built, you need a huge number of trees, about 2,000 oak trees. That's about 60 acres of forest. And in order to get that material cut and dragged out is a huge amount of labor. You're talking about an oak tree, a big oak tree, weighing anything up to 15 tons. So I think the likely answer is that the, the shipbuilding almost went to the nearest available sources of oak. And gradually, during the wars against the French that Henry V was involved in, they must have been getting through English forests at a heck of a, a rate, because you need large planks. You can't just use small stuff. And so they were getting through mature oaks. Uh, and, and I think it's possible that they went to those sites where that material was easily available, and it was a relatively short distance to drag with horses the material to the yards and to cut it. And when you're making these boats, you don't really need a massive superstructure. Um, they were often built on what was called a hard, a large area of beach. And that combination, a hard, a good source of wood, probably dictated where they were going to build, where they were going to be built. Um, on the shoot, we had uh, contact with a gentleman called Ian Friel, who is an absolute expert on this sort of thing. And if you look up any of his essays, they're well worth looking at. And he explains some of the processes and the documentary evidence. It's well worth looking at that material. Um, Susan was interested in uh, the business of Stuart reading. Um, uh, Susan's uh, are more comments than questions, but they're, they're nice comments um, that um, Stuart was reading the landscape and it always is a bit of a mystery how Stuart sees what you don't see um, but I think it's years and years of practice is one answer she was also very pleased to see Robin in there it was always a joy to have Robin he was such a sort of ebullient character um, Claire McAvoy I'm just taking these off a pad so you'll have to give me a moment um, really liked to like the episode and asked about wildlife in the habitat, uh, wildlife habitats in the area where we, where we excavate. And yes, it was an important part of everything we did um, to make sure that we had a policy that looked after the local wildlife as much as we could. I remember shoots being cancelled or we couldn't do it at a particular date because birds were nesting. That was one of the Scottish islands. Another shoot, which I think I've told you about before, we had to put up newt fencing, which cost a lot of money, I remember that, to protect the newts from falling in the trenches. And before we started the, uh, the work, we conducted a fingertip search of the grass and uh, never found a single newt. Um, but it was always kind of part of it. Badgers often were another issue that sometimes we had to manage working around particular badger habitats, badger dens, um, because quite a few sites in Britain, particularly Roman sites, are often being um, worked on, undermined and dug through by badgers. Um, and so it is a particular part. We always felt it was part of what we should do. We should sort of work with the local wildlife. And I have quite often memories of, of diggers being very careful about things like worms in the trenches, or if you found a mouse, 
I think one of the most uh, alarming pieces of wildlife I remember is Phil in the Caribbean gently scraping away at a section and a large hairy leg appearing out of the side belonging to a tarantula uh, spider and uh, what they call a donkey spider which I think is not quite so venomous but Phil reversed back out of that trench at uh, a very fast speed indeed. So local wildlife, very important, very interesting. Um, next question um, from uh, Julie Rampke. Um, some very kind comments. Thank you, Julie. And she refers to the report um, that was done by Peter Bellamy and an old friend of Time Team, Gustav Milne, um, about this site in Small Hive. And it was rather nice because the report at the end summarised all the people involved, people like Damien Goodburn, who'd all contributed to that site. And it did make you realise when you read these things just what a huge team of people all came together for those three days to do the work we needed to do. Um, one of the questions was about um, from Frida. Frida, you asked um, you know, how things have changed in terms of being on a site, knowing where we are. And it's one of the huge changes um, that has, has made a big difference to modern archaeology. Uh, we used to have things like dumpy levels and we'd be getting tape measurements from the nearest post box or big tree or something that was probably going to disappear in the future. But now we have things called total stations. We have GPS which is accurate to 0.7 of a centimetre. And we have an ability to look at everything on the site and very quickly locate it within three dimensions. So all the trenches, all the finds, everything we find is now precisely located by GPS and can be done very quickly. We had a wonderful chap called Henry who uh, used to go round with his GPS and locate everything and it made things so much easier and it kind of made us feel happy to know that whatever we found, even, even a small find, would have a point on a GPS database which meant in 100 years in the future you could go back to that field and go to exactly where that find had been made. Had been made. So that does make a huge difference. A final question, if I can get to it on my, um, on my thing, I will do. Um, somebody said, if you could have been present at one point in the past, what would it be? And uh, I was lucky enough last year to go to Mycenae, one of the many wonderful Greek sites. Homer referred to it as Mycenae rich in gold. Um, but the thing I loved about it, apart from the gold, which was obviously quite nice, was I went in the treasury of Atreus. It was like a huge beehive shaped place. You could have parked a double decker bus uh, in it. And in fact, it was likely that this was a classical Greek burial site, like a beehive tomb, but absolutely massive. And I remember one morning standing in that tomb and um, just thinking how amazing it would have been to be there when those royal burials were taken in there and what we could have seen, the things we could no longer see, the organic details, the, the wonderful ceremony. And, and that place still had an astonishing atmosphere. Um, and, it, and it was one of my lovely memories of, of last summer. Um, so that's where I would have liked to have been. Um, but it's a very nice question, you know, where, where would we like to go back to if we could time travel? So I hope I've managed to answer a few of those. Um, lovely to see Gustav up there. Um, Gus Milne has done some fantastic stuff with Time Team and a lot of his writings are about the, the, the place where the water and the land meet, those rather muddy places that preserve timbers. And um, I think it's one of those difficult things about nowadays bringing those timbers to light is you have to preserve them. And, it, and, and to preserve the remains of a large boat is extremely expensive nowadays and highly technical. And it can involve a huge amount of money. 
um, as, as, as the Mary Rose project, which has wonderfully kept this going, has managed to keep going. But I think quite often now archaeologists will be quite careful about making a decision to have a look for the remains of some of these marvellous vessels. So I hope you're all staying well um, and we've been able to answer at least a few of the questions uh, that you've sent in. Thank you.